Okay, everybody, this is uh, my, uh, whatever it is, uh, seventh or eighth uh, update on an article I wrote at the beginning of the COVID crisis. Um, and uh, you can see the original article there. I do updates every week. Last week's presentation is on YouTube there. Uh, there has been comment that people can't see the link swiftly and don't want to wait till it's up on YouTube. So I do try and get them up on the RDRF website. I'll try and do that tonight or tomorrow. Okay, so uh, I know I've said this before, but this is really a very, very special time. Um, and the announcement, Devon apparently have been awarded some money already and they say they're going to do something, but nothing's happening. We can't refuse. Okay, everybody, this is uh, my, uh, whatever it is, uh, seventh or eighth uh, update on an article I wrote at the beginning of the COVID crisis. Um, and uh, you can see the original article there. I do updates every week. Last week's presentation is on YouTube there. Uh, there has been comment that people can't see the links swiftly and don't want to wait till it's up on YouTube. So I do try and get them up on the RDRF website. I'll try and do that tonight or tomorrow. Okay, so uh, I know I've said this before, but this is really a very, very special time. Um, and the announcements last week were tremendously important for everybody who's concerned with sustainable back to travel and everything. So here we go. What happened is that a letter was sent by Mr. Rupert Furness, the Department of Transport, Transport. Uh, it's called Odin's Active Travel Funding and Indicative Allocations. I shall, however, refer to it simply as the Furness letter. Um, and it refers to funding uh, for local authorities. There are two letters. One was sent to local authorities in England outside London. One was sent to Transport for London, basically saying the same thing. And the key paragraph is here, uh, the, the amounts are only indicative. To receive any money, money under this or future tranches, you will need to show us that you have swift and meaningful plans to reallocate road space to cyclists and pedestrians, including on strategic corridors. And in my emphasis, Anything that does not meaningfully alter the status quo on the road will not be funded. Now, a uh, small caveat, this is for temporary walking schemes during the COVID-19 crisis and beyond. Don't forget, the Department of Transport is still shoveling vast amounts of money uh, to all kinds of things in terms of building more loads for more motor vehicle traffic. But many of us here never thought we'd see anything like that paragraph, particularly the last sentence. It is absolutely gobsmacking, tremendously important. And now, written by Andrew Gilligan. <clears throat> well, this is the thing. Uh, uh, here's the letter. Um, I will try and put that on the website. It isn't actually online, I don't believe, but it has been made available. Um, I'll try and get that on our website soon. It's, I should say it's not been made available. The DFT didn't want it to be public. Um, yeah. Whereas people have been ticked off for putting it out. That doesn't mean that it's not public, but it, they, they definitely, it wasn't intended ever to be released to the public. Um, so, and the, and the, the web link in there is not secure. So you okay. can put it in for your own counsel. So do you think I should not put it up on the website? It has been out on social media. People who put it up, official bodies, I won't name them, who have put it on social media, have been told off by the DFT. If you don't mind being told off by the DFT, that's up to you, Bob. I wouldn't, uh, if we're not in an official position, I don't think being told off by the DFT matters. <laughs> yeah. Okay, well, I'll have a think about it. Anyway, various comments were made by it. Um, there's a good article by Carlton Reed, And uh, as John said, I can reveal that Andrew Gilligan's fingerprints are all over the hard-hitting letter to local authorities. It's another good article by Simon Monk here. Um, it's a good article by Mark Treasure uh, suggesting that basically the people who want to go with pushing more cycling and walking will push ahead and become less car dependent. The others who don't will end up becoming more car dependent. And then an uh, interesting article by Robert Huxford of Urban Design Group in LTT Transport Extra about uh, 
professionals offering assistance to local authorities. Do have a look at those articles. Now, I'm going to give my take. Uh, sorry, Chris Boardman, very nice uh, brief editorial in the Times. Um, and uh, note that sentence, expanding access to cycling is not only desirable, it's our civic duty and we are almost out of time to do it. Okay, my, my take about it. First of all, 225 million quid, of which 25 million is for London, plus 25 million uh, for the bike repair schemes, plus there's 55 million for London already. So overall, that's about 200 million for London, for English local authorities outside London, 80 million in London. Uh, it's not anything like the amount of money going for road schemes. It's not enough, but it is for the temporary works and a lot can be done with it. Two, the priority is filtered permeability for low traffic neighborhoods. They talk about point closures is the phrase in the latter. Then after that, separated cycle lanes using temporary materials, which are of course a lot cheaper than concrete or stone. Uh, remember that sentence, the, the forceful, hard hitting sentence. Now, number four, the work has to be bid for swiftly. That's before Friday, okay? It has to be bid for swiftly and finished within eight weeks, all right? That's, so if people have started work, it has to be finished within eight weeks. Uh, it's two tranche with non-achievers not getting more uh, if they don't do anything in the first tranche. The second tranche, this is something nobody else has picked up on, it could be just me, it says the second tranche will refer to more permanent measures to cement cycling and walking habits. Now, I don't know if that means that they would upgrade the temporary materials to more permanent ones or whether there'd be more measures with the, the temporary materials. If it's more permanent, you get less done. And the funding can also be for existing plans, which are just being brought forward. They've been through the consultations and all the rest of it. So, and, oh, sorry, I repeated eight. My view is there's gonna be a lot to look out for this summer. From uh, effective measures, less effective measures, through to going through the motion stuff and attempts to do ineffective or worse measures. Whatever it is, if you think you're gonna have a relaxed uh, summer, forget about it. Uh, in other news, um, from 22nd of June, mandatory cycle lanes around Eng England can be enforced by councils using cameras. And if I may quote Mark Strong, small step in the right direction, new powers only apply where vehicles are parked or stopped in mandatory lanes as the ones with solid white lines with waiting or loading restrictions. They still don't deliver camera enforcement of moving traffic offences outside London. Uh, Scotland now has 30 million quid increased from the original 10 million for the pop-up schemes. Okay, so let's have a look at what cities in the UK are doing. Uh, this came from Belfast, the Sydenham Bypass, and uh, a few people started thinking about what it would be like to cycle this way up a dual carriageway. Um, then we were told there was another one on the other side. This is just the old uh, bordering a broken white line. Um, uh, in my view, you still need to have some kind of segregation there of some type. Uh, Cambridge, Girton Road, these went in, but advisory cycle lanes are not the kind of thing that we're supposed to be looking out for. We're supposed to be looking for various forms of segregation, because if you have advisories, guess what? You get car parking like that. Okay, now this is a biggie. I've uh, been various complaints about Bristol not getting its act together, um, but Tory South Gloucestershire 
hey, wasn't this wonderful? This went in, whole lane uh, coned off. But I hear from about half an hour ago, the council has taken it out because of complaints from motorists. Yeah, okay, or not okay, rather. Right, now Glasgow, to be considered 4th of June, this document and this link describes 25 miles of city centre roads for pedestrians and cyclists. Uh, Gary Outram has been trying to find out what Kent County Council were doing and he describes it as broad, vague and looking to encourage rather than enable. Attempts to get more detail are currently like trying to nail jelly to a wall. He's carried on with the nailing and his view is that they're saying things like we can't do filter, we can't close off roads, um, which is what they think filtered permeability means, because you will displace traffic onto other roads, so they were probably not likely to do it. Um, Leicester, there's been a webinar with Ab Adam Carr, uh, Adam Clark talking about it, and you can see a description here. Southampton here is doing stuff. Uh, you know, I leave it to locals who know the area to talk about what they're doing. Trafford, Greater Manchester has been supporting this. They've got a seven mile long bike lane, which is pretty good. Um, negative reports from Plymouth, Bristol, Edinburgh, and Devon apparently have been awarded some money already and they say they're going to do something but nothing's happened. I'm not quite sure about this. So I'll, you know, it's a, a press report. I don't know what the truth of it is. And here's some figures from Greater Manchester. And you, that's lockdown starting and you can see cycling is 0% as kind of here are the sort of weekend bits. Uh, but even before the weekend, looks like a good about a 50, 60 percent increase, although it's from, as I understand, a low base. OK, now I'm over to London and yes, uh, in some ways, apologies for being London centric, but London is due to get a fair chunk of the money and uh, stuff has happened and they make big claims. Uh, we've talked about this before last week. Um, I'm still concerned about no cycle training. A lot of cycle trainers out there who can do socially distance training. A lot of newbies, they need some support from people to tell them how to do a few basic bits and pieces and to help out. Today, uh, there was notice of more Santander hire bikes uh, because they've been setting records for their use. And also a 20 person limit on double decker buses. So. This is the point. There is going to be a big cut in capacity on buses. Uh, LCC, do go to that link if you're in London and do continue to email, send, put, try and put pressure on your local authority. If uh, they're already doing stuff, then you know they could do it a bit of support. And if not, tell them you want it. Okay, here's Camden. Uh, I've talked about what they've been doing last week. Um, it's Heartland Road, I think. Uh, 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 do go to their website. It's a very, very good website with maps of everything, indicating where things are being done, suggesting what issues are. Um, also been very good on the counts. Um, talking about showing exactly how the measures uh, are, are le how, how um, the amount of cycling is going up. So there you are, five road closures and a pair of pop-up cycle lanes. Uh, a bit like two pints of lager and a packet of crisps. Now, Ealing. Here we go, Ealing, where I used to work. Uh, this is uh, you know, a bit of work that was already planned, a bi-directional path next to the A40. Um, back in the day, in the late 70s, early 80s, I would ride along the A40. I would not now. Uh, it's going in, or it's gone in, but it stops at Kensington, Chelsea. Now on the Uxbridge Road, uh, this is very interesting, because as you know, I'm constantly going on about the struggle for space. 
I want cycle lanes, if they're there, to be wide. I want them to take space from general traffic and I want them to be easy for people to overtake it. And here we go. This, you can see, this was over the weekend. This is the old advisory cycle lane. It's going eastbound uh, in Acton. And uh, it's due to have been uh, taken off now with a solid white line going between these cylinders. And as you can see, there's a significant increase in the width of the advisory cycle lane. Uh, there's Julian Bell, who's leader of the council. Um, okay, now Hackney, Queensbridge Road, we've talked about before. It's interesting because uh, it's this cycle track has gone in. That was a pre-existing plan, but uh, there have been filtered permeability uh, measures put in during the COVID crisis. Thing to note here, the before and after, is you've got lots of car parking, big hatching, and see how it's changed. Uh, you know the key workers campaigning group to get key workers, health workers to get facilities. Homewater Hospital has come on board and supporting and lobbying Hackney Council. Right, now, on to the modal filter issue. This is Barnabas Road. Now, the signage is interesting because you might have thought you could just stick up no entry except cycles. Well, you can't because emergency vehicles have to get in. But if emergency vehicles can get in, uh, which is why you have the flying motorcycle signs, then people like him can come in. So it has to be enforced and that's why there are cameras. It would be nice to know what the effect of those cameras are. Are they actually having an effect? Are, um, are fines being sent through? Are the first offenders being let off? We don't know. Um, it's, uh, it'd be interesting to, have a day to, to go over the details of when you can have movable bollards, bollards that can be opened by emergency vehicles um, with the fire locks or whatever they're called. Um, or whether you need them, whether you don't need them, whether you, sh you can have cameras, how much it costs, etc. But this is, as these are going in, we need to think about these issues, in my view. Okay, on to Hammersmith and Fulham. Now, this is pretty dramatic. Um, this is the Hammersmith gyratory system, which is a ginormous uh, gyratory with a great big bus and tube station and shopping centre in the middle. Uh, You've got these temporary barriers put in, giving a nice, all of that inner lane round the outside clockwise going round. Um, I went round on Sunday and I noticed this and I thought, hmm, I wonder what's happened here. Why did they do that? Well, it seems to me that what happened is it got biffed by uh, some kind of motor vehicle hitting it like that. Um, hence the kink there. This is something that's going to happen. We need to think about how these temporary structures are going to be knocked about, in my view. Okay, now, more important again, this is King Street. I have some history here. Uh, King Street is big, again, another gyrated that, that went in 60s and 70s. Uh, in the mid 80s, Bill Mount, the engineer at Hammersmith and Fulham, put a segregated contraflow cycle lane in and when I was there in the 90s I extended it from Leemore Street here to go up to there where you could take a right turn go over Hammersmith Bridge. So you see what's happened here is they've put in in addition these extra barriers. Uh, some people might think it's a contraflow, I would hope not, I would think cyclists should just carry on coming this way with the general traffic and there's extra room for cyclists going up there and indeed if they go up there to that point they are here and here you see a stonking amount of space taken away from motor vehicles to cyclists and i like that uh, so that's interesting Okay, Haringey, there's an interesting campaigning thread there. 
uh, they haven't, they've been doing one pre-existing scheme. Otherwise, what I hear is that they're not good. Hounslow, experimental traffic orders at 10 locations. Using ANPR, uh, you should know what that is, automatic number plate recognition technology to monitor closures. Residents register their number plates and deliveries have limited time access. And some bus lanes are having their hours extended 24-7. Uh, incidentally, I just saw a tweet from Will Norman saying that uh, about 1,100 traffic signals have been amended to give more pedestrian crossing time. There was a tweet from Islington Council uh, showing uh, guys painting some new cycling symbols on the tarmac. Just some of the 167 new cycling symbols were adding to cycling friendly routes to make cycling easier. Um, and uh, Dan in Walthamstow said, renewing road markings is standard planned works. It is not, however, appropriate or relevant to suggest it is contributing to street space movement on your social media platforms. Um, telling them off nicely. I do hear that London Borough is and is doing other things though, so that's, it's not necessarily typical of what they're doing. Okay, Lambeth Council. Uh, pre-existing scheme, uh, so pre-existing programmed scheme, Bayless Road before advisory cycle lane with a bit of green in it. Now uh, pay a footway separated cycle track with uh, that looks like a floating bus stop there. Uh, Merton announced £700,000 to be spent before the furnace letter. Uh, don't forget, as Adam Reynolds tweeted, that that's only £3.31 ahead of the population in Merton. And Grant Shapps is uh, programming a, a billion on one road. Uh, Richmond on Thames, Q Road advisory cycle lane, uh, barriers in. Now, these are exactly on the advisory cycle lane. I did sort of voice criticisms, but John Dale said there's no way that it could be wired up. So I, sorry, I, just quickly on that, Bob, if that's all right when I come in, it's it was a mandatory cycle lane. Oh, factory, it was mandatory. Yeah. But it's a mandatory that was operational only between eight and ten every morning. All right. So, um, also, I, actually, I was just down there this afternoon. The thing is that road is eight meters wide, and you've yeah. got to get two buses past one another. So yes, all it, it's not wide, and but it um, it's as wide as I think you could reasonably make a cycle track. And those are, the idea, I believe, is that they will be replaced with ones in due course. Uh -huh. giving, giving protection, but then also perhaps allowing faster cyclists to overtake using the general carriageway if they felt it's safe to do oh, so. I but, see. But it's incredible. I mean, it's eight metres curb to curb there. Yeah. Um, what they have got rid of, because that cycle lane essentially used to be the, um, it was parking for Kew Gardens. So that's uh -huh. 150 parking spaces have been taken away and I believe they're not coming back, which is a good move. We, we, is... su we surveyed it. We did a cycle skills audit of the whole of Richmond about a year ago and we surveyed it and flagged this road up. I'm not saying it was, it was that, it was lots of other things, but we just told them what they already knew. Yeah, yeah. That's, that's fascinating, the 150 car parking spaces. Fact, that's very interesting. Uh, Royal Parks, there's been a ban on uh, Richmond Park cycling. Um, that's been partially lifted. Uh, it kind of indicates that you do have to keep pressure up. Um, now, Westminster um, published their plans, firing London's economic engine. Well, it didn't seem that way to me. Will Norman said it was ambitious. I have to say no. There were no low traffic neighborhoods um, uh, advocated, programmed, specified. Uh, so, you know, I would say that it looked pretty pathetic, actually. And one of the things is in Great Portland Street, going up to Regent's Park, they're putting in advisory cycle lanes, which is not what we were told it was supposed to be about. But um, anyway, we see what happens there. Uh, meanwhile, in Utrecht, um, can I come to school by public transport? This is an inquiry for secondary school students. Uh, it, it is the intention that students come to school on foot or by bicycle, especially if the distance is less than eight kilometers. So like even if it's over five miles, you, you ought to really be able to cycle it. That's the Netherlands. I don't do much on uh, what's happening abroad now because there's 
uh, enough to focus on here, one way or another. Um, with campaigning, uh, first of all, don't forget there's a crowd funder for opposition to the road building program from Transport Action Network. Uh, there's also this interesting website, Widen My Path, which uh, is all about um, where you would like stuff to go in. So don't forget things need to be happening um, really very, very, very quickly. So do get involved now. Uh, bicycle bingo, you still have to fight that. Um, I got picked up this, this interesting quote. When someone describes a livable neighborhood as closed roads, challenge them to find just one address that cannot be driven to. So, you know, we need to describe exactly what filtered permeability means. Uh, some rather negative views from Tony Travers in London, and actually quite worrying, quite a bit of pushback from the freight industry. So do watch out, you know, this isn't gonna happen easily. Um, and um, finally, I leave you with Dave Walker's cartoon, which you should have seen already. And um, that's basically it. So yeah, I thought we could look at school streets because it's one of the, the measures that were specifically mentioned in all the guidance that we had announced recently. Um, so uh, yeah, briefly, so I run a website called schoolstreets.org.uk and I've started that website after my own journey when I campaigned to have a school street at my children's school. I'm also involved with Brand Cycling Campaign, Be on the Bicycle Coalition and also Westminster Healthy Street. Um, so, whoops. so we're all kind of familiar now with the, the different announcements that have been coming in. Um, so quickly running through, so school streets uh, exist in the UK since the 2016. The first one was in Camden, in London. Uh, before this uh, pandemic, we had about 131 school street schemes altogether across the UK at different stages, um, either going through consultation or permanent one. Uh, they are delivered through uh, the Road Traffic Regulation Act, uh, Section 1 for outside London, Section 6 and 9 for London, and it's basically a pedestrian cycle zone. So, and as discussed just earlier, the, uh, the, the key difference is with the enforcement. Uh, cost, so uh, whether you go for bollard or for camera and PR camera, so that would be from 5k to 20k, and obviously you add on top the, the works by the officer's design consultation and so on. But as an example, Leeds is doing six at the moment within this uh, emergency context, and they're going to do six for 15K, so. Um, so, so yeah, it could be either as a standalone uh, measure or within a wider scheme, like a low traffic neighborhood. Uh, it's important to remember that one in four cars on the road during the, peak, the morning peaks are school run related and the pollution usually triples um, during that time around the schools. And also in terms of road danger, it's 14% of all children um, on the road um, are killed during those times between seven and nine, three and five. So this is why they are very important. So following the announcements, um, some local authorities have decided to accelerate this, the permanent scheme they were working on already. Others have offered temporary schemes uh, using the um, the Traffic Management Act, the Section 18, and um, others have done absolutely nothing. And the excuse usually is uh, they, they were kind of waiting for the funding to have a bit more detail. So now this is um, this has been revealed um, a few days ago. So the key difference, as discussed just previously, is the outside of London local authorities they don't have the powers to enforce moving traffic offences. Um, I've been asking the GFT um, and others have done too. And um, my, the latest reply I had from the GFT was very negative. They said that they had no current plan to enable um, local authorities outside of London to enforce them. And then more recently, Ruth Capbury um, did ask again, and it was a bit more positive because the GFT said that they were giving it thought. So we'll see where it leads us. So what's, what's the situation? So either we do nothing and we might end up with that kind of um, picture on the left, which is from Australia, that one. And it's just absolutely awful. 
or we can do something very quickly like they've done in Bristol and just uh, putting some punters there and just um, opening up the streets for um, families and children going to school. And this is following perhaps as a, a wider scheme rather than just on the, on the school, outside the school. So we all know that School Street is, is a no-brainer. Um, it does work, it reduces road danger, it reduces pollution, it reduces um, it increased active travel to school, which is very important because if you are um, active to school in the morning, your level of um, activities and everything that is good for you in your body will, will stay with you all day and throughout your life as well. It does increase uh, independent mobility and now we've got this added uh, benefits that it will help with uh, safe distancing. Uh, families have been asked by the schools to uh, queue up outside the school gates. So obviously some of them will probably spill out on the road, so they do need to be safe. So we do, need, we do know that school streets, they work. There's enough information now out there from um, evaluation reports from previous um, schemes, so a long, long established schemes like in Scotland or in London. Uh, the parents want it. Um, recently, there's been um, a new survey done by Global Action Plan, and it says that six out of ten parents are worried about the increased level of traffic. And also, more than half of parents are planning on walking and cycling more um, after lockdown. We are told to avoid public transport, so we do need an alternative to go to school. Um, there's obviously, it's only three, I think, three or four year groups going back at the moment, mostly. Um, but it's still quite a lot of people going more or less at the same time, at the same place. And then in, in September, when we are all going to go back, it, the, the problem will still be there because we will still need to distance ourselves. And there's more and more evidence, obviously, um, that pollution and lack of act active travel worsen the effects of COVID-19. So it's it's important. So I'm, I'm trying to keep track of um, what's happening in this area um, across the country. So in London, there's quite a few borrowers who've um, already announced that they were going to either accelerate schemes or uh, putting forward some temporary one. Um, outside of London, a few, a few um, uh, regions as well. And then uh, materials uh, that can be used. So for permanent scheme, you've got the um, either removable bollard or collapsible bollard. So this is an example in Westminster. And then there's this one in Croydon where they, they use the ANPR camera, which is, is far more efficient. It relieves schools with, you know, dealing with maybe the abuse from some people who object to it. And it's all automated, so the fines will be triggered and sent directly. And for material, temporary materials, so we're looking at, I think this example is in Kingston, very recent, so it's just a simple buyer. Uh, we can use cones, I think Westminster is looking at that, uh, or you can use those um, concertina barriers. So the problems, the challenges that we may face. Um, so due to lack of funding for camera, or the lack of enforcement power outside of London, uh, the temporary buyers will have to be put in and out by staff member of the schools. And I know that my school already, they've declined the offer um, of a temporary one because they say we don't have the staff to do it. Um, so that's a problem. And also, if there are staff to do that, obviously um, they don't have to stay next to the buyer. They can just put them out and then do whatever they need to do at the school gate. So if there's no, no one there, what, what would be the level of compliance? Um, staggered school times, so uh, it will, it's likely that it will be on the longer period. So for instance, instead of having just one hour in the morning, one hour in the afternoon, it might be a bit longer, or maybe a few times you have to pull them in and out. So again, um, staff with a short hitch might be a problem. So should we look at parents volunteers? I know that local authorities, when, because this is a, a, a council-led uh, scheme, so I think legally you do have to kind of train up the people so they can be on the on the highway. Um, but I mean, volunteers could be trained up um, because they are all on experimental uh, traffic order. The consultation period will be uh, shorter. Um, so is there a worry that um, there will be less time to educate and inform people? So we might have more uh, objections. 
from people who don't necessarily understand um, the scheme or who, who fail to see the bigger picture um, of why uh, this is necessary. And um, uh, local authorities also said that um, the temporary one might be on for maybe up to July or September. So how, how can we, what can we do so they become permanent? So solutions, um, uh, keep campaigning, just continue as ever, I plot through. Um, there's quite a lot of um, tools and resources out there, uh, Living Street, Sass Franz, uh, the Widen My Path is one way also to um, uh, demand, you know, just put them on the map saying we, we do need that here. Common place for councils, we use that. Mums for Lungs, they have um, a ready to go letter you can use. Global Action Plan, um, that's the new campaign. They, they are uh, with a focus on, on school streets, so that's one one you can get support and information from there. There's quite a lot of um, information on school streets, uh, the UK, how to do it, how to engage with parents, family, staff, uh, the wider school community. If you do um, engage with professionals or so, um, highway officers, councillors, there's obviously the Hackney Toolkit, a very good um, source of information and how to do them. On the TfL web, um, document, the guidance that they've issued on school streets, it is um, from page 20, there's a load, lots of information about active travel that obviously is applicable everywhere, so that's what, um, a good source of information too. Um, just continue the conversation with parents. Um, when you do have a school street, a, a temporary one, just try to document as much as you can. Uh, take pictures, take video, uh, obviously with consent with the families and the children, but just to document exactly what it is and uh, how, what the difference it made to your school one. And then, you know, when the time comes that they might just, you know, just look into them and see, okay, should we carry on or should we just get rid of it? So you, you have the tools, maybe the, the resources, the, the ammunition to, to push for it. And um, through the website, I'm starting to receive emails from people uh, complaining, you know, that, oh, I live on that road, um, um, they are taking my freedom away, they say. Well, maybe we should think that, you know, we, we used to go to walk and school, to walk and cycle to school before cars took everything. And um, we, a lot of people have rediscovered that. So when people are talking about freedom, you know, I'm just thinking, you know, whose freedom are they talking about? You know, it's, it's for everyone. And for people in London, again, the TfL um, has a map which can give you the exact width of the, the pavement outside the school gates. So that's a good way to um, also, you know, make the case and say this is very important because we can't have parents queuing up on, on a very small uh, pavement. And also uh, the language. So I think this has been um, discussed as well. Um, positive language is very important. So instead of saying banning cars or closing or restricting access, maybe we could say opening up the road for children and people. We can protect them, having like a protecting ring around the kids, uh, prioritizing people uh, walking, cycling, living in that road rather than people just using it to drop their children off. Um, enabling choice for transport because we are we have been told that we cannot use um, or we shouldn't use public transport, so we need an alternative. And oops. And then um, I can't see that. What's the weather? Um, yeah, it's urgent. It's an emergency. It's, it's it's urgent that we need to do something about that. And also the the space. Um, uh, if there's fewer cars on the road for you know. Um, unnecessary trips, there will be more space for people who really need to use them, who don't have any other um, alternative but to use their car for their um, specific mobility needs, so it, it benefits everyone really. Um, yeah, that's about it, so uh, thank you, and if you want to find me, that's where you can find me. Hi everyone, Roxanne from Cam Cycle, Cambridge Cycling Campaign. Can you see a uh, Spaces to Breathe campaign? On the screen? Yep, I see a nod. <laughs> I can't tell what's being shared, so we'll find out. Uh, no, apparently my desktop, bear with me. Let's try this again. That's better, excellent, okay. Um, so I spoke at Ideas with Beers uh, a few weeks ago and um, showed, I guess, the campaign we were planning to run. Um, and I thought that with everything going on right now, it would be timely to 
to show where that got up to um, and we have a presentation that we're using that's doing quite well for us um, so I thought I'd quickly whip through that so that people can borrow whatever they would like to borrow for that um, and I'll just say it's Cam Cycle's 25th birthday party this evening so hence the Cam Cycle t-shirt so happy birthday Cam Cycle 25 years of great campaigning um, so very quickly, you can you can find this document um, in the presentations folder for ideas with beers. Uh, but I'll just show that we are now well and truly out of the short term campaigning period, which was about just staying safe and healthy, um, protecting yourself, you know, just helping people to get out on their bikes, what was safe, and for those who were trying it for the first time to to give them some advice and encourage that. Also really important to capture stories at that time to help in our next stage of campaigning. We are now well and truly into the medium term and it's, it's great that we predicted we'd need to do this and evidently this is what we've had to do. So um, this is very much now about how do we get the space that we need um, and I must say that a few weeks ago when I was presenting this, I had absolutely no idea <laughs> that we would be here already, that it would be happening so quickly. Um, and uh, actually just how much progress we can make in a really short period of time. But I'm sure like, like I am, everyone else who is campaigning and working on this is probably utterly exhausted right now. <laughs> uh, so I really hope we just get a rest soon. Now, I'm going to change my screen to the presentation that we're using with stakeholders. Uh, let's see if this is working. Yes, can we see someone with a face mask? Yes, we can. Excellent. So um, this is the presentation that um, we've been using to speak to just about every stakeholder we can get, our, get access to um, over the last few weeks and it's really been quite successful. Now, a lot of the stuff in here will be things that the people on this call already know, and I'm not going to go through that, um, but it's uh, just a way to show how we're getting buy-in with these people. Um, so, of course, we're really, we need to update this slide because now we've got the new letter um, from the DFT just to really push to those people that we're meeting with that this is coming from the very, very top. This isn't now grassroots campaigners begging for a bit of space. This is an order, get it done. Um, so we're making the case there. Uh, we're also really pushing um, people to think about how they're communicating about this because actually this isn't about cycling. And if we get too focused on the outcome of some bike lanes, we're missing the big outcome, which is about um, you know, keeping us safe and healthy um, now and into the future, as well as getting our economy going. So starting out with really saying this is about social distancing, protecting the NHS from um, you know, injuries on the road, from people catching um, COVID-19 coronavirus, um, and very much about also pointing out that not everybody has a car. So just saying get in your car isn't going to work. There's so many people who will need other options. Um, so this works for councillors for their messages. This works for business leaders when they're thinking about getting their organisation going again. Um, this just honestly, everyone's getting this presentation right now. Um, pointing out as well who we need to prioritise. So absolutely the first people out and about are the people going to work when, I mean, the whole school situation is a bit confusing, but we know that at some stage, children in some areas at some times are going back to school. Um, but we also need to, to keep remembering that people aren't traveling um, far and they will be doing all their exercise around home. That's still the situation. So what we're trying to get people to realize is that <laughs> they need to think a bit more strategically about what needs to be done. Um, and what we've seen in Cambridge is that there's a list of schemes somewhere a shopping list and we don't know how those lists are can how those schemes are connecting together are they creating a network are they being prioritized uh what is the the measurement of what should be done first we just don't know um so what we're trying to do is really push our decision makers to to push for a network once you've worked out broadly your network then what are the key corridors that you need to design what are the interventions along those corridors then get on with the implementation and the monitoring and the managing and this is quite iterative because as you identify interventions you might realize that that has to actually change the corridor or change the network but but keep working through that 
Um, so you all know, I'm sure, about planning and network, um, but we're really pushing that this isn't something that needs to be designed from scratch. We already have done the work in Cambridge. There's work being done on the local cycling and walking infrastructure plan. We have something called the city access study. The knowledge is already there. Um, what we're asking for them to do is take that work and then rather than the expensive engineering um, interventions, look at how they can change those for temporary interventions. But they already know where people are trying to go. So this isn't a lot of hard work that they need to come up with from scratch. Likewise, we're doing our own map uh, because we're doing some work. <laughs> We'll skip that one. So the other thing that's coming out um, that we're really pushing is these designing key routes. And, and this is amazing work from one of our trustees, Matthew Danish, who I don't think is on the call today. Uh, he's out busy campaigning. Um, and really just showing that it doesn't take that long to get from A to B by bike. Um, and we're really using this to, to capture those strategic thinkers, those people who like the big shiny consultant reports um, and showing how people can get on and off the cycle network as well. If we make this look like public transport, people will start to see that it is comparable and this is something they can do. They'll see where their cycling journeys can connect to the public transport as well. And I must say that just, just this picture has been amazing at um, getting buy-in. We had a double page spread in the newspaper, including this picture as well. Um, so by all means, if you want to copy this approach, please do so. Um, and we've got lots of them. And obviously where it's red, that's where there's a link that's missing. And we've, we're saying this is possible with those short-term interventions. It won't be perfect, but these are possible. So our campaigning that um, we had just started kicking off when I spoke to you a few weeks ago was about um, identifying the interventions that we could use. So we've been crowdsourcing those with a form. We had over 150 unique suggestions that keep coming in. Um, and we've then put those through our process to work out, well, what does that mean? What is feasible? What kind of thing could be done? And we're putting that onto that network map um, and refining those corridors and the network. Um, and again, I just, it, it, this took us 20 minutes to set up and we still haven't seen anything like this from our local council. Um, you know, I think we were well ahead of the curve there, but it would have been great to see the council having something like this, as we know other councils have done. So then we have a colour coded system to show what kind of interventions there are. And that really helps because you, you, temporary cycle lanes might be great, but if the council doesn't have the right stuff in the shed, they can't do it. And we know that getting, getting our hands on barriers and cones is going to be more challenging. Um, so you know, maybe we have to filter our, our network and show, well, here's how you could do it just with modal filters or just by removing railings or clutter. So whatever you're able to do, you can filter this and go out and, and get it done. Uh, we're also educating people on what the interventions are. I won't go through those because we know them, but um, teaching people about modal filters, that like, really, you could achieve all of that with one bollard? Yes, yes you can, so go campaign for it. Um, we're also really pushing the, the low traffic neighborhoods um, and showing how you can connect these up together. Um, and one of the points I'm really making is that is we need to make our local streets our holiday destinations this summer. You know, we, we travel abroad so we can experience those wonderful squares and those wonderful you know, streets in other cities. Why not have them here if we're not going anywhere? We can't go and visit lots of people. Let's get to know our neighbors a bit more and capture that spirit. Um, and uh, we'll note I'm, we're pushing play and exercise as well as just getting people to work. And I think we have to be tapping into that also because a lot of people will be working from home and it's not just about commuting. Um, we're also talking about shopping streets uh, and that's always going to be challenging to win over uh, traders, but um, we know about shopping streets, school streets. We've just had a great presentation about those, uh, just showing everyone else is getting on with it. So why don't we? monitor and manage we know about. So the other things that um, we're really pushing is that there does need to be some kind of communications about this. We need to have the behavior change programs as well. Uh, and the big thing I'm pushing is that I want to see all of the stakeholders in Cambridge coming, or Cambridgeshire coming together to actually have a shared communications program because we do have to overcome a bit of the anti-cycling 
rhetoric, even here in Cambridge, which it's just seems crazy that so many people cycling, but there's still this negative reaction to people who are cycling. And we need to point out that that person that you're stuck behind in your car, who's on their bike, is that same nurse that you've been clapping for every week out the front of your house. If they're a hero then, they're a hero when they're on the road. So what kind of positive communications can we come up with? And I think we really need to focus on this working together um, uh, feeling that we have right now. We've seen the community come together in so many ways. We need to keep that going in our transportation. Uh, if you are fit and able, you should be riding a bike or walking because there's very limited space on buses and trains and that needs to be for those people who have no other choice. They're not fit and able, the journey is too far. Likewise for driving, you should not be in your car unless you really do not have another option um, because we need to save that space for the people who really, really need it. So can we, can we try and tap into that, that attitude we've had in our community for everything else and somehow get it to work for transportation as well. And Cambridge is very complex. We've got a lot of stakeholders and local authorities here. So seeing all those logos together on some kind of communications campaign, I think sends a really strong message. From a campaigning perspective, I know we always focus on infrastructure first, but for me, if it's just, if it's a way in to get all those organizations actually collaborating and working together, that then opens up the door for more collaboration on the infrastructure as well. So I'm just looking for whatever ways in I can find. Um, the other thing that we're doing that's being really effective, and again, I mentioned that very complicated local authority structure that we have, um, but we're building a regional campaign. Um, so we're trying to get pop-up campaigns all over the the combined authority area. Um, if there isn't a campaign, we're helping make one. Um, and by saying that we're now this coalition of organizations across Cambridge are asking for this, it's not just for the city. It's been really effective and it's helping to win over the rural councillors who make decisions about what happens in Cambridge. So it helps us in Cambridge to get rural support and it helps those people out in the in the fens and in the other villages and market towns to have the, the might of CamCycle and our resources behind them for their campaigning. So it's it's win-win. Um, and that is our campaign. There's lots of great stuff on our website as well. So uh, do go to campcycle.org.uk forward slash spaces to breathe and you can have it all. Just take it, use it. If, if it's completely repurposed, try and credit uh, CamCycle where you can, but we just want everyone to be a success. That was my very quick run through. I'll stop now. John Dales is going to give us an angle that we haven't really raised today. I was talking to someone today about um, why aren't you going on about the Greenway routes, Brian? And uh, I'll just say quickly what I said to them. I said, look, if you put a, a bid in by Friday to take some two metre unmade, unloved, over overgrown path and turn it into a five metre fully lit like a cycle highway across some greenery, then I think that'd go down quite well with the government. So, uh, Definitely think we should do that. But somebody in the 1930s built them already, and John's going to tell us about that right now. Yeah, I just want a bit of sympathy before I start. Can you imagine being Brian's boss? Can you just imagine what that's like? Okay. It turns out I'm, I'm just his panic PA, essentially. Um, yeah, so I think this arises, what I've got to say arises from something that I think a couple of questions were asked last week. And really all I'm going to do is I tried to share a screen here. Let's see what I can do. Let's share that, share that one first. Um, uh, you can see a map, I hope. Give us a thumbs up, Brian, if you can see it. Yeah. This is some work that was really led that I've been partnering as a, some kind of practitioner with uh, cycling historian Carlton Reed, who you may well know through uh, Roads Were Not Built for Cars, Bike Boom and stuff like that. And what Carlton found was that in the 1930s in Britain, the government, um, the Department for Transport, basically had a got in touch with their counterparts in the Netherlands and said, show us what to do. How do we do this sort of stuff? And just started building cycle tracks. Unfortunately, it started, there was a plan for about 500 meters of road that would have 500 miles, sorry, of road that would have these cycle tracks on. And it started in the mid thirties and finished at the war and was never picked up again. Maybe 300 miles worth got, got, um, got built. And some of you will know, I think the Lost Stop Road one in, um, uh, in Manchester is really quite famous. But they are, as it were, they're cycling space, which may be in decent condition, may have been built over, and even better condition may have been grassed or virtually unfindable. 
but uh, essentially there's a bunch of pretty decent cycle tracks and often on both sides of a dual carriageway that's a fairly typical thing that is there to be found and potentially to be repurposed um, I shan't take too much of your time because I just want to basically introduce you to what they are. There is this map which I'm looking at now. Um, this is just a quick um, map that um, Carlton has put together. There aren't really any click throughs in it, but it shows as many bits and pieces of this have been found. And some of them are in the middle of nowhere and some of them are really useful and some that could be built upon and used. I happen to live in West London. So, for example, uh, where I live. Uh, I just went out the other day to cycle again a bit in Southall here, just a, it's on the A4020, the Uxbridge Road here, you can see there's some of the A40. Um, this is the uh, A4 in Osterley running out, to, goes all the way out to the south side of Heathrow there. This is the A316, which is uh, again essentially the northern bit of the M3 as it comes into London. Uh, they're everywhere these things and uh, some of them are there kind of hidden in plain sight some of them are not quite in plain sight because they're parked all over some of them are have, as I said been tarmacked over and I suppose the purpose of this is just to let you know that this exists we'll provide a link to this map so you can see what might be in your area but also partly for you to, to think oh I wonder if there are some near me or if you know there are some here to do perhaps a little bit of exploring and then if you wanted to or were able to say to, to get a view well actually here's some space now quite often they start and end with a clang and one of their particular failures i'll show you a quick a few photographs is that when they go past side streets they're, they're really poor priority <clears throat> but they're there to be made more of than the space has been taken and actually potentially there's more to be done here what, what Carlton has done is quite handily is, is pr put together some um, photographs but in a package here, which gives some of the telltale signs that you might be looking for. So if you, are, if you um, what I'm going to try and do is share this screen now. Uh, stop sharing that one and share my screen so that I can just show you some of these things that you might uh, basically, shall I try, if I share the whole screen, I think that does it, doesn't it? Can you see, Brian, what am I showing you here? Can you see half of a, a map and half of it's uh, an explorer? Sorry, you're muted, Brian, yeah? Yeah, we can see it. You so, can. Um, so one of the things is, if you're just looking, all of these things are nine feet wide, so make sure you don't take one of those, um, one of those modern tape measures out with you. They're nine, can you see these? You can see the pictures, Brian, yeah? Great, yep. okay. So they look a bit like this. This is an old one. They're just, they tend to be strips of tarmac alongside um, busy roads, quite often dual carriageways. That's a classic example. And that's another one of the classic telltale signs is where you've got something that may look like a path or you're not quite sure what it is or it's parked in alongside another footway. There's a decent chance it's one of those. Here, I don't know if, you have, if any of you who live down south of Ebgo cycling to Box Hill. Um, this is the A24 that swings past Mickleham as you go to that. If you've ever cycled alongside that on the cycle track that exist, um, used to exist on both sides, um, there's only one now, it's a two-way cycle track, that guy resting on his bike there is doing just that. He's So nine meters wide is one thing. They tend to be on both sides of the road. Here's a, a photograph that uh, Carlton took with um, uh, his uh, a drone that shows, you can see, um, they're both sides of the road. It's a typically dual carriageway. Uh, again, another telltale sign. You can see this footway and this thing, and then the thing, and then the footway. You'll see in this particular instance, like in many, uh, it's just become parked on. Quite often they are technically cycle tracks, but they've been parked on forever. Um, and that's uh, become the, um, the standard use. I mentioned earlier that uh, I just went down to the A4 near where I, I live in Austerley the other day. This is a bridge over the um, uh, Piccadilly line there and you can see how it used to be at the top and how it is at the bottom. There are, um, there are these telltale signs. So nine meters wide, both sides of the road, potentially meshes with the modern. So what you have here, this is an example from Nottingham, although that's now tarmacked, that was originally uh, one of the 1930s routes. Um, what else can we say? That a, another telltale sign, soon, because at the time that they were built, Quite often, then they're near to municipal housing or council housing. Um, that's one thing. They um, the, this the, this idea of there's that next to. So if you see something like this and think oh, that's a little weird, why why that? Well, it's probably one of them. 
Um, and again, quite often, that is a, quite a good example, last, like that last photograph of, it just looks like a bit of something. It's not necessarily marked as anything or, or it's just seems there and perhaps it's not, and that's why quite often it's used as something else. Um, the entrances are a bit of a giveaway. They just suddenly swing in off the nearest carriageway because sometimes these sections are really quite short um, and um, that's what they look like. And there's another example then. They just started where they started, so to speak. Um, what else is there? Just a couple of other things. They often have curbs. Here's an example, that, although it's, um, you can see it's been grown over here, but they, were, they originally had proper curbs. That um, starting to be grown over thing is something because sometimes um, they are, sorry, I wonder if I can quite find it. They, they, they might actually be there, but they're literally, all you can see now is about a meter in the middle and it's essentially being, uh, nature has taken its place again. They're often blocked like that because nobody kind of knows who or what they are. It's just some space that has been repurposed. As I say, that's sometimes partly because it wasn't always clear what was what. A giveaway sign, a give, giveaway sign is just a kind of concrete that they were built with. As a, sometimes it's been um, tarmacked over, but very much they're, they're normally concrete and therefore you can see quite often in the sections they're ribbed. They're sometimes like that, as you said, that, that it's all there, but actually you would hardly know, but um, it could be cleared. That kind of con concrete there, if you can see with these rather irritating um, breaks between the, the different sections and so they're ribbed, but equally they uh, have often been repurposed properly, uh, like this photograph shows. And I think the thing is just to maybe have a look at the map, see what's near you. Maybe there's something not far from you that you've always thought, oh, oh, hang on, or just by now thinking about it, you think, well, that could work. This is one actually just near my mum's house in Whitley Bay, up in the Northeast. I'm delighted the fact that one of these things runs. And that's been pretty decent, Nick. You know, not great. Um, if I just quickly go along, you'll see that one of the problems is that People don't necessarily use it. This is on the other, the other side, actually. He's on it, but he's about to go onto another bit and be loads of people here. But it's not used because typically this is what happens at your side streets. Um, and But that's, to be honest, pretty easy fix. What you've therefore got is a you've got the space, sort the junctions out. You could tarmac them differently, even if there is parking that's often on the inside. These are things that not all of them by any means, but you might be able to make the most of. I'll just finish with a little bit of uh, a, let's see what I found. Just a, a, a typical thing, a bit of a video that I took yesterday on the one nearest me. It's a very short section. I don't know if it was longer, but you'll see it comes with some of the, I don't know if you can see this. Is that okay, Brian? Give me a shout. Yeah, you could. <laughs> It starts very kind of like it just, oh, hang on, what's going on here? The original start, as you can see, we're just about to join in now. It just comes in like that. It's that classic kind of concrete. In um, um, just in situ concrete that was built, that probably hasn't changed. I'll just go across this junction and, and, and this will show you. It's always quite difficult doing this when I use a handheld camera, which I do, which is you're never quite sure. You're looking over your shoulder, you're breaking because that's rubbish, right? But if that's all there was to fix, then you've got space alongside a dual carriageway, which could be really comfortable for cycling. Um, I think that's all to say at the moment. We'll get, I will provide a link to, um, to that map, you can have a little look, look around yourself. Um, if you wanted to get in touch with myself or I can then put you in touch with Carlton, if that would help if you think you've found something. Um, it, it's just there and you think, well, somebody asked the question last week, there's some information that you that might be of value to you. And, but also just the idea if you're out and you see something looks a bit like that, have a look, it might be on the map, you might know more about it than Carlton does that we do. I'm happy to hear anything about that. There you go, Brian.